Hi, students, and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria here on the west coast of Canada. I hope everybody is having a fantastic week. Uh, this is a members chat class. Everybody is welcome to watch, and we are looking at an IELTS reading section. Uh, we're looking for that high band nine test literacy. Yes, literacy has to do with reading and writing. And we are going to discuss strategies on how to get those high, high band scores in your IELTS reading exam. This lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Please check us out there. Um, for the general IELTS and for general IELTS reading materials, check us out at gieltshelp.com. Now, general and academic IELTS reading are a little bit different, but uh, do be aware that section three of the general IELTS is very, very similar to the academic IELTS. So doing academic IELTS reading materials is still very, very good practice for the general IELTS exam. Hi, Mahi. Hi, Brahrat. Welcome, Farduas. Uh, welcome, Sarana, and welcome to our moderator, Carolina. Uh, good to have many students joining in on this chat. Uh, students, these materials are coming from our websites. This is our academic IELTS web portal here at aehelp.com. You can click that big red button to join the premium package. It's a one-time payment for lifetime access. We are an official British Council IELTS Test Registration Center and certified agents, so you're in great hands uh, with us. For the general IELTS, it's the green background. You can click this big red button to join. When you do, you will have a My uh, Student account. And in your My Student account, you will have original practice exams, computer based exams, full online course, um, and access to our mobile apps also. So you can download our apps, Academic IELTS Help and General IELTS Help from your app stores, link them to your web accounts for some really great learning. Um, if you have questions, just send me an email to adrian at aehelp.com and I will answer those questions in short notice. Uh, Hashna, thank you for the good morning. It is bright and early here at uh, 5.30 a.m. In fact, it's not even bright yet. The sun goes up at around 7 o'clock these days. That's when sunrise is. All right, everyone. So, We've still got lots of classes this week. We've got reading right now, followed by uh, listening part one and part two today. Uh, we'll have more reading and more listening tomorrow. And then on Saturday, we'll have a Q&A session and some speaking. So lots and lots, okay? Uh, Mahi, I'm really glad that you're finding there's lots of value for your money in the premium course. And we're always adding new videos and new content. So that's great. Yeah, our goal really is to uh, help a lot of students around the world. That's what makes us happy. Um, all right, everyone. So let's get into today's uh, reading passage. Uh, let's take a look at this. We'll do this together. Um, this is coming from uh, an exam that's in development right now. This will be available on our websites um, later in the year, early next year. So um, when uh, we're looking at a reading passage and when you get to the reading section, your very, very first step is always to um, read the title and then visualize the information and do a little bit of critical thinking just so that you help your brain understand the reading passage by collecting the relevant information that's already in your head from previous years of school and experience. So here, this is a reading class, so make sure to read uh, with me. And if you can, read aloud, okay? So practicing some aloud reading where you actually hear yourself read is always a really, really good idea, okay? 
All right. Um, so here, the title is The Formation of the Himalayas. All right. So first of all, um, what are the Himalayas? Can anybody tell me that? So um, if I were, well, let's say, a... 10 year old student and you're my teacher and I ask you teacher what are the Himalayas what would you answer for that so what are the Himalayas uh, spelling that word has always been an issue for me Himalayas there we go so what are the Himalayas all right um, can anybody tell me that uh, Paulo says it's a group of mountains in the Nepal area. Yeah, uh, Paulo, it's called a mountain range. So, Uh, if my geography is right, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I seem to remember from my geography classes that it's a mountain range in Northern India, Nepal, Tibet, and Pakistan. I believe the mountain range touches all of those. Uh, Mahi again, series of mountains. Yep. Um, Irfan range of mountains is better. Yeah. So it's a range of mountains in, uh, Northern India, Tibet, Nepal, Pakistan, I believe it touches uh, or all of those borders, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I am. Um, but that's what I think um, they are. Okay, and why, why are the Himalayas? So, so what's the reason that they exist? So why do these mountains exist? And of course... I also know that they are the tallest mountains on earth, including Mount Everest, right? Okay, so I would probably add that into the what are the Himalayas, all right? And why do they exist? So why do we have this beautiful Himalayan uh, mountain range uh, in this region? Okay. So Shahid says the Himalayas are mountains, part of India and Nepal. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Hashan Preet says Himalayas are a series of mountains situated in the northeastern part of India. Okay, Shahid says Pakistan not. So, okay, I'll take that out. Again, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm guessing a little bit there, but. Okay. I'm not exactly sure exactly the parts that they touch, but yeah, roughly, right? So again, just do your best in this part, okay? So why do they exist? Um, they exist because of the movement of continents mainly the Indian uh, subcontinent uh, smashing into the Asian continent, right? So I think a lot of you know this from your geography class. We have these continents, uh, continental plates that are moving um, around on the molten uh, mantle of the earth and as they kind of smash into each other you get these earthquakes you get the movement of land and you get this folding effect of the land as these uh, mountains push uh, towards the sky yeah so june says collision between the indian plate and the eurasian plate uh, very good uh, june okay all right um, so and of course visualize right so visualize I am a mountaineer uh, climbing uh, Mount Everest and looking over the uh, sublime 
uh, mountain range. Okay. So a mountaineer is a person who climbs mountains. Okay. So I see myself as a mountaineer. I've got my backpack. I've got ice kind of forming on my face, frost and the extreme cold up at uh, 7,000 meters. And I've got my pickaxe. Okay. That's a little axe that I can pick at the ice with a pickaxe. I've got rope around me. I'm tied up there. I can feel the elements. It's exciting. Um, there's a lack of oxygen, of course, and uh, I'm climbing the Himalayas. So uh, maybe I have a Sherpa guide uh, with me. Okay. Um, why do I want to visualize? So why would I, why do I want to take this um, few seconds to create this visual imagery of the Himalayas and I'm including myself, I'm making it unique. So why do I want to do that? This is kind of an important tip. In fact, it's a very important tip um, for the IELTS. So uh, you should always visualize information uh, throughout your IELTS exam. and your studies because this helps you too. What does it help with? So uh, this uh, visualization solves a lot of issues for students when they're uh, preparing for an exam. Um, so Bakrat says it helps to stay focused. Yeah, absolutely. It helps you stay focused and it helps you stay engaged with the information. Engaged with the information means that you don't zone out. You don't start thinking about other ideas or the information doesn't just simply pass through your head. So into your eyes and out through the back of your head, but it kind of locks the back of your head and it stays and it keeps the information in there because it makes it relevant uh, for you, right? Um, so it helps you to stay focused and engaged. And it also helps uh, to keep information uh, organized. Uh, and it helps you to uh, both remember and uh, recall information. Okay. So oftentimes uh, I hear IELTS students say, oh, I read the passage and then I forgot what I read. It's like, well, yeah, it's that's a problem. Even if you're a native speaker, if you read a passage and then you forget what you just read, then it's going to make it difficult to answer questions on that topic. So you really want to remember and recall information. So store the information and be able to use the information. And for that, you have to make information relevant. Okay. All right. Uh, so formation of the Himalayas, um, I look through the text, I can see that there are some uh, subtopics that are in bold and they're in question format. So this is kind of like an, almost like an information brochure, right? So how does continental drift work? Okay, so my thinking here uh, about how or why Himalayas exist, uh, that was good. Uh, now I'm not going to read, I'm just going to read these um, subtopics to give me a more clarity on uh, this reading passage. So how did continental drift create the Himalayas? Uh, drift means to float, to move slowly. Okay, so a piece of wood is drifting in the ocean. All right, so continental drift here. How did it create the Himalayas? Um, what's next for the Himalayas? So the future of the Himalayas and um, other effects of movement. Okay, uh, now I want to look at the questions and I want to read questions which contain uh, information that's directly in the passage. So here we have a uh, Himalayan formation. Okay, so again, it's the creation of these mountains. So lots of uh, geography here. Moving land masses, that's continental drift, rising mountains. 
Um, how does it work? Okay. Mm, creating the Himalayas. All right. So read with me here, students. Don't just listen to me. Make sure you're reading with me. And then we have some true, false, not given. Okay, true, false, not given. A lot of students are curious about how to solve these questions. We will talk about that in this class. Uh, the first step to correctly answering true, false, not given is to ignore them before reading the passage, okay? You don't know which ones are not given. You don't know which ones are false. So reading these statements, it could be a waste of time. It could be confusing, all right? So don't do that, okay? Yeah, Mahi, so visualization absolutely helps to create a mental log um, as you're imagining, right? Because you can visualize as this mountain climber the steps that happen um, with the Himalayas, creating these Himalayas, okay? All right. So um, match the following concepts with details about them, okay? So it's another type of question. It's matching information. And we have three pieces here. So all of this information is going to be somewhere uh, in this text. Uh, we have number 11, 12, 13, um, and then we have these uh, definitions, okay? So A, continental drift, B, uh, convection, and C, asthenosphere, okay? Now, if you know what these mean, great. That's going to help you a lot. If you don't, do not panic. They're probably defined in the text. Okay, so number 11, theorized more than four centuries ago. Okay, uh, when you're looking at these, try to paraphrase them before you start reading. You probably will not see this exact wording in the passage. So you want to think about a different way to say that, okay? Um, so what would be, students, another way uh, to say this? Theorized more than four centuries ago. So how can you say that in a different way? Paraphrasing is really, really good uh, practice to improve your English, especially your higher level English, your academic professional English. And of course, if you don't know um, the words, the synonyms, then just use a thesaurus, uh, use the internet to help you. So what's another way to say theorized more than four centuries ago? There's definitely another way, way to say that, okay? So, um, and when you're at home, what you want to do is you want to write the paraphrasing above uh, the original uh, statement, okay? Uh, yeah, so Harwinder says, speculated before 400 years. Okay, uh, good Harwinder. So instead of uh, before 400 years, I would say 400 years prior. So speculated 400 years prior. Harwinder, that was good. Um, I would do it like this. Speculated... 400 years prior. A very nice paraphrase. It's a very beautiful, concise paraphrasing, Harwinder. So speculated 400 years prior. Uh, theorized and speculated are very good synonyms. Okay. Mahi says hypothesized more than 400 years ago. Uh, Bakrat says described more than 400 years ago. That works as well. So um, hi hypothesized over 400 years ago. That works also, all right? Very nice, okay? Okay, um, states that Earth's land masses have shifted position over time. So again, there's another way to say this, states that Earth's land masses have shifted position over time. What's another way to express that? Again, uh, paraphrase. You can paraphrase just about any statement. English has a massive vocabulary 
Uh, and oftentimes I'm surprised uh, at the paraphrasing that students come up with. It's not what I would come up with, but it works beautifully. So uh, again, lots of ways to do it. So states that Earth's land masses have shifted position over time. I'm going to paraphrase and then let's see if you come up with something similar or different. Okay, um, so that's what I would write as one paraphrase. Again, these paraphrases don't need to be perfect. Uh, they should be accurate, so you shouldn't be giving different information. But you don't have to necessarily paraphrase every single word. Uh, the goal here is just to get a different idea of the content so that when you read the passage, you will match that much more easily. Okay. Uh, Paulo says, advocates that dry areas of the world have moved during the years. Sure, Paulo, why not? Um, explains that the planet's continents have moved with the passing of time. Uh, that's how I would do it. Okay. Uh, but both of those work, Paulo. Um, I think the one you have is a little bit different, but it's fine. Um, okay. Heat rises from the lower levels of the earth towards the higher levels. Okay. So higher temperatures move from below the earth um, to above the earth, all right? That's how I would maybe uh, paraphrase that. All right, so again, uh, anytime you have matching information questions, uh, do this kind of paraphrasing, and that will really help you, again, to engage the information, pay attention to the information, and be more accurate when you see the answer in the text, okay? So it's really a good way to improve your score, your accuracy, and also to improve your lexical resource, your vocabulary, okay? All right, so now once we've done this, and in the real exam, these first few steps are happening very, very quickly, okay? You're only spending a few minutes on this, maybe uh, four or five minutes at most, uh, not even three minutes. Um, and then you read, you spend about, let's say eight minutes reading and about nine minutes answering questions. Okay. So let's read this together. And then we're going to get into answering the questions. Okay. Make sure to keep visualizing. So you are that mountain climber in the Himalayas. Uh, you're a mountaineer. So think about that as you're watching these events happen, okay? So here we go. Um, all right, let's do it. Uh, Shahid, we'll get there. So I'll uh, look at your question there, um, A to D, A, B, C, we'll see, okay? All right, um, so the formation of the Himalayas. Uh, here we go, everyone. Let me just adjust it a little bit so... All the words are on screen for us, okay? And again, if you have the chance, read aloud, okay? So you can hear yourself move the mouth. So here we go. The Himalayas are a mountain range in Asia which separates the Indian subcontinent from the rest of Asia. The Himalayas contain some of the world's highest mountains, including the highest point in the world, the legendary Mount Everest. The range is not only tall, it is also massive, stretching 2,400 kilometers across a roughly west-east arc. The creation of the Himalayas is one of the clearest examples of the theory of continental drift, which states that Earth's continents have moved relative to each other over millions of years, put forward over 400 years ago by Abraham or Tellius. Continental drift is an example of a scientific theory which is generally accepted as fact today. So here I can actually see uh, this theory of continental drift and uh, 400 years ago, right? So that four centuries ago. So 
there's that answer to that one question. I think it was number 11 or number 12, okay? Now, I'm not going to stop and answer questions while I read because that is distracting, okay? So in the real IELTS, just keep reading. You're not going to forget that you have the answer here. Um, you will remember that as soon as you recognize that, okay? Um, so do not stop to answer questions while you read. It's not necessary. And do not underline answers either, okay? All of that is distracting. Um, you're all smart people, and believe me that you do remember answers as you read, okay? So just a quick tip there. Again, it's another important tip, okay? So uh, do not stop reading to answer questions and do not underline uh, or circle answers. Uh, this is distracting and will or and can uh, cost you points uh, later on, okay? Uh, don't worry. You will remember the answer, okay? So believe in yourself, all right? Okay, so just keep reading. Um, here we go. Yeah, Paulo says that was very, very clear. Okay, um, so just keep going. All right, let's keep moving along. Uh, continental drift theory posits that the continents have not always been in the positions they are in today. And the existence of the Himalayas is strong evidence of this theory. But how does continental drift work? And how did it create the Himalayas? Okay, let's keep going. So question, how does continental drift work? Okay, the earth is not a solid rock. Instead, the earth's crust floats atop a layer of semi-solid, very hot, 1300 degrees Celsius material known as the asthenosphere. Okay, asthenosphere, very hot material, visualizing this. So under my feet, under this beautiful mountain range, there's liquid rock that's super hot. And that liquid rock is the asthenosphere. In this layer, convection takes place, bringing heat from lower reaches of the planet upwards towards the surface. So here's my answer to convection, movement of heat. Hot gas and liquid rises up, replacing cooler and denser gases and liquids. This circulation of hot and cold pushes the plates of the Earth's crust, shifting the appearance of the Earth over millions of years. Where a plate goes and how fast it goes depends on the convection currents below the surface at any given point on the Earth. Okay, good. So I'm almost imagining like a soda pop here with ice cream floating on top and the bubbles pushing around the ice cream. All right, um, how did continental drift create the Himalayas? The short answer is India caused the Himalayas. A hundred million years ago, what is now the Indian subcontinent stood 6,400 kilometers south of its current position near the current position of Australia. Particularly strong convection currents below the region began to push India northward. Every year, the landmass came about 12 centimeters closer to Asia. That's about a centimeter per month. The approximate width of your pinky or little finger. This may not sound like a lot of movement and it certainly is not on small time scales, but when taken in the context of enormous time frames, this distance becomes significant quite quickly. 12 centimeters per year is 12 meters per century, 120 meters per, per millennium, and 120 kilometers per million years. Okay, so visualizing that movement. This means that the 
A 6,400 kilometer gap could be closed in about 50 million years. And indeed, this is what has happened. Over this immense time frame, India slowly but surely made its way northward on a collision course that could not be stopped. Approximately 40 to 50 million years ago, the Indian landmass collided with the Asian continent. With nowhere for the landmass to go and with forces underneath still propelling it forward, the landmass went the only place it could go, up. Over the past tens of millions of years, the Himalayas have formed as a result of the unstoppable forces pushing India into Asia. In this time, peaks like Mount Everest has risen to over 9 kilometers above uh, sea level. Okay, uh, fantastic. So really powerful visualization here. Um, I even saw 50 million years ago how cool it must have been when India just touched that Asian subcontinent and there was no mountain range yet. It was just flat. Can you imagine how interesting that would be to see uh, visually today 50 million years ago where there's kind of a flat landscape connecting India uh, to the rest of Asia okay all right um, what's next uh, for the Himalayas the Himalayas continue to grow in fact they grow approximately one centimeter per year Again, this may not sound like a lot, but it means the mountain range will grow about 10 kilometers in a million years. This means that in 10 million years, the mountain range could be 100 kilometers tall. If a person could travel in time, they might see a truly colossal mountain range, which dwarfed everything seen on today's earth. Yeah, that's incredible. So just like I'm traveling back in time, we can travel forward in time and for all of the mathematicians out there, uh, I wonder if anybody thought about this. So uh, Himalayas continue to grow. They grow approximately one centimeter per year. Uh, remember what it said here when the continent was moving from Australia? It was um, one centimeter per month. So basically the crashing of India into uh, Asia uh, has slowed the movement of the Indian subcontinent by about um, 12 times, right? Okay, so here every year the landmass came 12 centimeters closer to Asia. Now that it's smashed into Asia, the mountains grow about a centimeter each year. So it's this incredible crashing effect that we're seeing okay all right so other effects of the movement the creation of the himalayas is not the only effect of india's slow but steady crash into asia the same forces that push the himalayas upward also create huge tension in the earth's crust which from time to time must be released resulting in massive earthquakes some of history's most violent and destructive earthquakes came as a result of the Indian subcontinent's relentless surge into Asia. Interestingly, another common consequence of plate tectonics is continental drift. Volcanoes uh, do not take place in the Himalayas. This is because the mountain range is so large and the crust underneath is so thick that any magma moving upwards solidifies before it can reach the peaks. In a sense, volcanic activity is extinct in the Himalayas. So no volcanoes in the Himalayas. Okay, fantastic. So now let's answer some questions. And here's another important tip. Ideally, you don't need to frantically search the text for answers. Okay, so ideally... Um, you can either A, answer the questions without looking at the text, or B, you know exactly where to go in the text so that you can give quick and accurate answers. Yes, you're very welcome. I hope you were reading with me. Okay, uh, let's do this. So let's answer these. And if we don't know the answer, we'll look in the correct position. Okay. 
Um, here we go. So Himalayan formation, okay? Moving land masses, rising mountains. So continental drift and the formation of the Himalayas. The Himalayas are massive. They span over 2,400 kilometers and their formation provides evidence for something, the theory that our planet's land masses have shifted positions over eons. Okay, they repeat this word several times in the passage. The only reason you should be looking at the passage here is to check the spelling, but you shouldn't really be looking at what this is because if you didn't get that, you probably didn't understand a lot of this passage. So uh, Paula Reese and uh, Mahi Bo say that that's going to be continental drift. Absolutely. Now, it's a common noun, so you can use all lowercase letters, okay? And some of you are probably going, oh, this is easy. Well, this is passage one of the entire reading section. It should be fairly easy, okay? So continental drift, Rashika, all lowercase letters, right? Continental drift, um, watch your spelling of drift. Okay, uh, how does it work? The asthenosphere is the something of the earth that below the crust. That is below the crust. There's an is missing there. Okay. So the asthenosphere is the something of the earth that is below the crust. Um, well, here you might say, okay, the asthenosphere is the liquid rock, maybe molten rock, molten layer, or just simply layer. Now, if I'm not sure exactly which words come in here, and of course, I always pay attention to the instructions, no more than two words. Paulo says liquid layer. Um, yeah, I think liquid layer is pretty good. I'd be pretty confident with that. But Paulo here, I might check really quickly. And this long word here is something pretty easy to look for. I know that it's at the beginning of the passage. I know it's talking about um, the uh, continental drift. So I can go back and I can find this word, right? And there it is. So very quickly, remember it's by that 1300 degrees Celsius, okay? So uh, instead, the Earth's crust floats atop a layer of semi-solid, very hot uh, material known as the asthenosphere in this layer. So it doesn't say liquid layer, it just says a semi-solid layer, okay? I would be comfortable with putting in the word layer only, but if I'm a little bit worried about the accuracy, then I would put in semi-solid. Now, when a word is hyphenated like that, it is considered one word, okay? So if I want to be very accurate, I can put in semi-solid layer, right, with the hyphen. That hyphen will count as only one word, right? So semi-solid, this is considered one word, okay, because there are no spaces before or after the hyphen. Semi-solid layer, okay, and this is where you have to be careful because it's not purely liquid then, right? Okay, so be careful. IELTS is uh, when the answers seem too good to be true or too easy, you have to be a little bit cautious. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. In this layer, hot gas and liquid rise up and replace cooler areas. This process called something causes the changes of the position of the Earth's continents over millions of years. Okay, um, so here I remember that the answer, let's see if anybody else remembers what it is. And Thomas Vinod, yes, semi-solid with a hyphen, okay? Harvinder says convection. Yeah, very good. Um, bonus question for everybody. 
Uh, where in your house uh, might you see the word convection? A lot of us will have this word on hint, hint, one of our appliances in the home. Um, where do you see the word convection in your house? They're even called this convection. It's a type of appliance. I'll give you another hint. It's in your kitchen. Okay. At mall, you'll get the idea. <laughs> Rashika, very good, Rashika. Thumbs up, Rashika. Bam. Um, yeah, your convection oven. That's right. Um, so many of you will have an oven in your home that's called a convection oven. It's the type of oven uh, where the air circulates around and around um, with a fan so that it uh, bakes or cooks your chicken uh, much, much faster. Okay, so it's a, called a convection oven. So it's a good word to know even outside of continental drift and mountains. Is everybody clear now on this idea of convection? Convection means the movement of heat around and around from hot to cold, okay? So you have an even cooking uh, system, okay? All right, so convection it is. Your convection oven. Now many of you are going to go, oh, okay, now I should remember this word because it's not just for the Himalayas, okay? Um, good question by Paulo. So Paulo says, number two says, um, that semi-solid is included in the answer here. So we said semi-solid layer. Um, it is a very hot and is semi-solid. Um, yeah, Paulo, good point. I probably would not. So as soon as I saw semi-solid here, I would take it out of my answer and just leave layer. Uh, it's a very good question. If you see the information in the answer, it's definitely not necessary for your answer. You probably won't get it wrong, but it's not necessary. Okay. Very good question, Paulo. Very nice. Good eye. Good attention to detail, Paulo. Okay. Uh, Thomas says convection microwave. Yeah, Thomas, you have that as well. Very good. So Thomas Vinod says not just the oven, but the microwave can be a convection microwave as well. And yes, I have seen those, Thomas. Not as common as the convection oven, but I have seen them. Okay, uh, so here we go, continuing with the same process. So creating the Himalayas. In short, the subcontinent of India caused the Himalayas. India used to be much further south, closer to the modern country of something. I think that was very clear. This is definitely not a question that you should be looking for. And I'm sure a lot of you will get this. Uh, it is a country continent. Make sure you have a capital A. Uh, don't lose marks for silly mistakes. Please do not write a small A for Australia. Okay. It's the name of a country, name of the continent. Uh, though India moved only 12 centimeters per year, this rate added up over an something amount of time. Uh, anybody know what word goes well here? Something amount of time. What do you think is the word that's used in the passage? My guess would be it's a word that starts with an I. Yeah, very good, Bakrat. Immense. Now be careful with the spelling, Bakrat. I believe it's an S. My spelling isn't the greatest either, Bakrat. That's why I would probably check. But I believe it's immense with an S. Okay, immense. Okay, Andre says I would check the paragraph. Yeah, so I might check the paragraph for this as well. Uh, over this immense time frame, and it is with an S, India slowly but surely made its way. Okay. I was able to find that very quickly because I had a good idea of this number here, the 6,400 kilometer gap. Okay. All right. Uh, 
Eventually, the force of India pushing into Asia created the highest point on earth. Highest point on earth. Uh, you can search for it, but you shouldn't have to. Uh, Mount Everest. Okay. All right. So there we have our first six answers. Okay. Yeah, Irfan, you can write out Mount. So M-O-U-N-T and Irfan, good job with the capital M, capital E. Uh, you can shorten Mount or Mountain by just M-T dot. And they'll, they'll take that on the IELTS, okay? That's absolutely correct. We usually shorten it. Okay, so now we come to these true, false, not given types of questions. Okay, true if we know the information is true based on the passage. False if we know that the information is false based on the information in the passage or not given if we're not sure what the answer is based on the information given in the passage. Okay. Uh, Thomas, good answers, Australia and Mount Everest. Okay. So, uh, true, false, not given. There's a very simple system to figuring out the correct answers to these questions, all right? Uh, number seven, in millions of years, the Himalayas will be much taller than they are today. Is it important for this passage um, to understand the size or the height of the Himalayas? Paulo Reese says it's important. So yes, it's important. When we know that it's important, we know that it's given or most likely given. So it's very, very likely that this is given. Now, this was a very visual answer. So the correct answer here is, and then that's our next question, right? So is it true or is it false? Okay. So is it true or is it false that the Himalayas will be much taller uh, than they are today? Rashika, Andre, everybody says true. Yeah, um, it was very visual. They said a uh, hundred kilometers. Can you imagine? You can go to the top of that. We don't need spaceships. We can just take a, a tram uh, to, to space and then... Uh, I would definitely make launching spaceships much easier. Just build a space station at the top of the Himalayas and you can just easily just float um, the spaceships into space. Okay, um, so number eight, India and Australia were once connected. Hmm, is it important to know for the Himalayas, the formation of the Himalayas, if India and Australia were once connected, is that important? So do I need to know that India and Australia were once connected? And yeah, <laughs> Irfan says, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, it's, it's not. Okay, so it's not important. All right. I agree. Um, we don't need to know that. Okay, it's going too far back in time. So, of course, the world has changed its shape throughout the billions of years, but we're not looking at that time frame. We're not really interested. So, um, when you have a no to the first question, then it's an obvious not given. Okay, because it's not important to the passage. Okay, right, Mahi, not given. Okay. All right, uh, number nine, the tension between India and Asia has caused mountains to grow and earthquakes to occur. So the tension between India and Asia has caused mountains to grow and earthquakes to appear. Is it important to know that the forces between India and Asia are related to these mountains growing? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, absolutely. Uh, is it true? So we know it's given. So next is true or false? Yeah, I mean, that's what the whole passage is about, right? So it's true. Don't overthink it. Okay, sometimes it is that simple. So, so far, true, not given, true. 
Um, volcanoes are active in the Himalayas. Is it important to know um, whether or not there are volcanoes in the Himalayas? I bet it is. Yeah, I think uh, people in India, people in China, people around the Himalayas would be living in a very different kind of attitude and uh, mental state um, if they knew that they were active volcanoes. I mean, could you imagine if Mount Everest was an active volcano and people were scared of uh, Mount Everest exploding? Um, so yeah, it's definitely important as humans. I'm sure we are very curious whether or not the Himalayas are active volcanoes. So it's going to be given and it's going to be false. Okay. So true, not given, true and false are the correct answers. All right. Uh, so that's how you do it. Okay. If it seems easy, that's great. Then you're on the right track. Okay. All right. Last set of questions. These matching questions now, uh, 11 to 13. Um, write the correct letter A to D. I see what you're saying there. Yeah, so this should be A to C, not A to D. Okay, so write the correct letter A to C, continental drift, convection, asthenosphere for 11, 12, and 13. Now, these should look very familiar because they're basically paraphrasing uh, the first set of questions. So another good trick in both the listening and reading sections is use other questions to help you solve questions, okay? So theorized more than four centuries ago, continental drift, that shouldn't be too hard. States that the Earth's land masses have shifted position over time, okay? A, uh, continental drift. Heat rises from the lower levels of the earth towards the higher levels. B, convection. Okay. Quick and confident answers are coming from my head. Um, asthenosphere is not used here. Pay attention to this. Note, by the way, you may use any letter more than once. That means that you might not use all of these. You might use just one three times. Okay, in this case, we use A twice and B once and C none. Okay, uh, be very careful with that. Some students think that there's like some weird test formatting where it's like every answer has to be used, but careful, there's no rule that states that. Okay, so you always have to use uh, correct ideas and logic, not, you know, like some students think if you write abacadabra. Uh, for multiple choice, you're going to get at least 50% correct. No, there's no, <laughs> there's no magical rule to multiple choice like that. Okay. Uh, so be really, really careful with this type of question. Okay. You shouldn't get these wrong because the answers are very, very clear. Okay. Um, yeah. At mall, you can have the same answer more than once. Yeah. Note, by the way, you may use any letter more than once. Theorized more than four centuries ago, that's continental drift, okay? States the Earth's landmass has shifted over time. That's the actual theory itself. It's still continental drift, okay? So be very, very careful. All right, everyone. So that's it for the reading. Um, that's the way you do it. And of course, you have to do that in 20 minutes, not in one hour like we did in this class, but of course you don't have me explaining every single sentence step by step, right? So when you're doing it in your head, uh, when you're reading in your head, it is much faster. Don't rush, understand the information, visualize the information, okay? All right, Bakrat says, can we go back to question nine? I have a doubt, okay? Uh, number nine, Bakrat, the tension between India and Asia has caused mountains to grow and earthquakes to occur. Um, yeah, it's true. Okay. So tension, meaning the force between the Indian landmass and the Asian landmass. So 
It's correct. Um, if something's not clear there, Buckright, send me an email about it, okay? And then I can explain that to you further, but that's definitely correct, okay? All right, everyone. So uh, for lots more reading and uh, writing and speaking and listening help, check out our websites uh, where you have a My Student account. Uh, when you see the website, it'll look like this for the general IELTS, green, and then blue for the academic. Click that big red button to join the premium package. Again, it's a one-time payment for lifetime access, so it's really, really well worth it. Um, and um, you'll have access to lots and lots of reading exercises. Uh, I will be back, everyone, in 30 minutes with listening, and we're going to do uh, a listening section, part one and two. Um, so if you liked uh, practicing reading in this class, then join me in half an hour and practice some listening with me. I'm Adrian. I'm signing out from Victoria for now. Uh, thank you, uh, members, for your support. Thank you, Carolina, for moderating our chat. Uh, thank you, Thomas and Shahid over in General English Help Channel. And hopefully I'll see you all shortly. Bye for now.